Hello guys, today I want to cover decorators, properties, and closures. Yeah, closures in Python. Honestly, this will be one of my longest videos, so uh, here goes. <clears throat> Let's start with decorators. Python has an interesting feature called decorators to add functionality to existing code. This is called metaprogramming, as the part of the program tries to modify another part of its program at compile time. So let's go over a quick example. Um, why is it giving me an error? Okay, there we go, it's just spacing. Anyway, here we have a few functions. Well, actually we have one function called first, which takes in a string and prints it out. So when we run it, it will print out hello. Then we have Okay, well then we have a second variable called second and that should basically inherit the function, the first function, and do the same thing. So it should print out hello both times. Alright, well, okay, this isn't an example of decoration yet, this is just an example of why we would need one. Basically when you run the code, both functions give you the same output. Here the names first and second refer to the name of the same function object. Now things will get weird, functions can be passed as arguments to another function. Such functions that take other functions as arguments are called high order functions, and here's an example of one. And yes, I copied and pasted literally everything word for word from a different website. Again, I'm trying to get over this Python series quickly so I can move on to more things. Okay, so here's a function, inc. It will return the integer plus one, so it's short for incrementation. Then we have a function called de decrement, or dec, which returns the integer minus one. Now we have a function called operate which is a polymorphic function. It's polymorphic because it can change its output depending on the input and the way it's called. It takes in the function, so either increment or decrement, as an argument, and then it takes the value that's going to be placed in the sub-functions as well as a second argument. It creates a, a variable called result, which is equal to the function, and the function is left ambiguous. It's basically the argument's function, and then it returns the result. So now, our high order function operate is called twice, except in the argument, one takes increment, and then the other takes decrement. And let's see what happens. We should get four and two. All right, we have to print it. Keep thinking these are already printed, but uh, let's just show it. Print. I know there is a way to uh, check the output without the print function, but I'm just too lazy to figure out where to do it in Visual Studio. Sorry guys, I'm just lazy and cheap. Anyway, 4 and 2. So in the case of 4, the increment function was called and adds 1 to 3. In the case of 2, the decrement function was called and subtracts 1 from 3. Furthermore, a function can return another function even, so it doesn't have to return just a value, but even a function. So here's an example of that. So I have a function called isCalled. And inside there's a subfunction called isReturned, which prints hello. And then it returns the, out the function. What that means is it will the return function will call the subfunction, and it will take the output that the subfunction gives out and give and return that to the function is called. So then we have the function is called assigned to our variable, and when we run it, it prints out hello, because that's what the subfunction outputs. That same output is transferred to the higher order function. Yeah, basically here it's a nested function which is defined and returned. And each time we call, we call the is called function. And at this point we should know a little, a little bit about closures. That goes over in more detail how to manage the output of a sub function or a nested function. When I say sub function or sub uh, class, I mean nested function, or nested class, sorry about that guys. But anyways, I will go over closures later in the video. So yeah, just wait for that. Anyways, functions and methods are callable as they can be called. In fact, any object which implements a special method call, which is a built-in function, is termed callable. And the call function with the underscores is part of the def keyword, which is why everything, every function or class that's assigned to def or class or the class keyword is a callable object. So in the most basic sense, a decorator is a callable that returns a callable. Basically, it takes in a function, adds some functionality to that function, and returns it. 
here's an actual example of a decorator. And let me just run this really quickly to see if it doesn't need any print functions. Okay, it doesn't. Anyway, we, our output is I am ordinary, I got decorated, and then I am ordinary again. So let's go over this. We have a function ordinary, which prints out I am ordinary. And that function was called on line 10, which is why we get our first output, I am ordinary. Now here we have our decorator, the make pretty function, which takes in another function. And inside we have a sub function called inner, and this will print out I got decorated, and then it will run the function that was placed as an argument. And then it returns the inner function, while the over function returns the nested function's output, which was lines four, three and four. And then we assign to the variable pretty, the make pretty function, and as an argument, we put in the ordinary function. And then we run pretty, the variable, and that gives us I got decorated and I am ordinary. Basically, it's running the ordinary function, but it's running it through the inner function, which is being run through the make pretty function. So the inner function is the decorator for the sub function, the function in the arguments, and make pretty is a function that decorates the argument function with the inner function, if that makes sense. And yeah, basically it goes over what I just said. Generally, we can decorate a function and reassign it as ordinary, is equal to make pretty, pretty ordinary and then when we print out ordinary again let's see what happens same thing basically we're taking the function but instead of creating it instead of doing the decoration and assigning it to a different variable we are taking the decoration function and modifying the original functions call and then once we recall the same function it has now been decorated. To show that, let me just comment line 10 out. And we're only calling the ordinary function, which only has the print function, but when we run that function, it gets its decoration function printed out as well. Because the call of the ordinary function has been modified by the make pretty function, and thus we have our decorator. Decorations are a common construct, and for this reason, Python has a syntax to simplify this. We can use the at simple along with the name of the decorator function. So, let's do it. And let's get rid of these. Okay, instead of going through lines 12 and 13, which I went over earlier, instead we're just going to use the at make pretty decorator syntax and it will basically do what lines 12 and 13 did so this time I don't even have to redefine the ordinary call it will just decorate it for us because the at make pretty function has been called before the ordinary function is even defined it's basically the same thing as doing lines 12 and 13 well lines 12 uh, yeah same thing line 12 basically this is basically just syntactic sugar to implement decorators Good job, W3 schools or uh, program is. I actually forgot where I copied and pasted this from. I think it's in my notes somewhere. I don't know. Anyway, decora decorating functions with parameters. The above decorator was a simple, was simple, and it only works with functions that do not have any parameters. So here's an example of a decorator being used with a function that has arguments or parameters. So here's our decorator, decorator function. Here's our decoration that takes in two arguments A and B. It will print out a statement, I'm going to divide A and B. And if B is not equal to zero, or if it is equal to zero, sorry, it will print it cannot divide. Because you cannot divide A by zero. You can't divide anything by zero because it's undefined. And then it just returns it. And then it will return the function AB, which is the argument for the smart divide, and then it will return inner. And then here's our basic divide function. It really just divides the argument A by the argument B and then returns the division. Remember, the divide operator is a mathematical operation. It does division. And then we have our division func divide function being decorated by the smart divide function. And then we call it twice. One to divide two by five and the other time to divide two by zero. 
And then it says I'm going to divide 2 by 5, I'm going to divide 2 by 0, and because you can't divide by 0, it returns loops cannot divide by 0. Also, let me just, uh, let me print out the outputs. Sorry about that. Okay, I'm going to divide 2 and 5, and the output is 0 0.4, which is 40% of 1, so yeah. And, just out of curiosity, let me see what happens when we try dividing by 0. It's going to probably return an error, or just an undefined. It should be undefined, but I don't know if Microsoft Visual Studio Code can catch that, so let's see. Okay, it just returns none. So I guess, yeah, undefined would be returned as none in Visual Studio Code. Anyways. That's how we can add more functionality to a simple divide function. The added functionality simply prints out what's happening. And... <clears throat> oh yeah, the arguments are from the original function, the divide function, which is which in itself becomes an argument for the smart divide. And then inner, the arguments for inner are carried over from the function that's used at smart divide. Basically, we're not redefining A and B, and the reason for that is because when we return the argument function, it takes A and B. The inner is basically returned from the argument function in Smart Divide, and then we return the inner function. If that makes sense, it should hopefully. Inner A and B. I mean, it's a little weird for me too because it doesn't really define how, like, I, because it doesn't really show obviously like how the inner function knows what the values of a and b are from the divide function. But I'm just guessing the return a and b function here tells it what a and b are supposed to be from the divide function. Yeah, line eight is definitely a part of the inner function's namespace, and then the return inner is part of the. Uh, smart divide in space, so yeah, it, it's definitely that. The key observer will notice that all the parameters of the nested inner function inside the decorator is the same as the parameters of the function it decorates. Okay, so th here's the explanation. Taking this into account, we can now make general decorators that work with any number of parameters. Oh, so I guess it's not an explanation, it's just a statement. In Python, this magic is, yeah, it is magic. It's done as a function, uh, arbitrary number of arguments with an arbitrary number of kw arguments. In this way, arguments will be the tuple of the position, positional arguments, and the k arguments will be the dictionary of the keyword arguments. An example of such a decorator will be... Well, no, this doesn't work with this example, but this is just a, a general example of how it works. So, here we have our decor decorator function, works for all, which takes in the function it wants to decorate, which is linked to the return. This is basically the format of how it knows a and b, what a and b are. This is the sub function, inner, this basically shows how it knows a and b. So the arguments and k arguments are directly linked to the return function argument and its arguments and k arguments. So yeah, it's basically what I just said, that's how it does it. This print function doesn't have to be a print function, this could be any functionality you want to add to it. As long as the return argument function has the arguments, then the inner sub function will know what those arguments are. Anyways, we can also chain decorators in Python. Multiple decorators can be chained in Python. This is to say a function can be decorated multiple times with different or the same decorators. So we can have more than one decorator for a single function. We simply have to place the decorators above the desired function. So, here is an example. Okay, we have two decorators. One is a star decorator and the other is a percent decorator. They basically place in the star character 30 times, twice, above and below the function, and then the other one does the same for percentage. They do the same thing, except this one decorates a star, well it prints out a star, this one prints out a percentage. And then we have both our decorators, star 
and percent. And then our function is, it's, it'll simply print the message hello. Let's see what happens when we run this. There we go. Because star is called first, star is printed 30 times in the first line as well as in the end. Because it takes the function, which is the percent decorator and the function inside of it. And before printing those functions and after printing that function, it will print out star 30 times. And then after star we have the percent, which does the same thing but with percentage signs, both before and after the function that's supposed to be decorated. And then the output of the function that's supposed to be decorated simply prints out hello. Order does matter, so instead of star, if I did percent and then star, and then it's inverted. So the percent sign comes first and last, then the stars are sandwiched between them. So order matters on how you implement your decorators. This is basically a visual example of how the compiler takes the function of the decorator and how it assigns it in comparison to the function that's being decorated. Anyway, that's all I want to cover for decorators, and I'll be right back pretty soon with closures and properties. Alright guys, now I'm going to cover closures. Closures can avoid the use of global values and provide some form of data hiding. It can also provide an object-oriented solution to the pro an oriented solution to the problem. I'm not sure what problem they're talking about. When there are a few methods, one method in most cases, to be implemented in the class, closures can provide an alternate and more elegant solution to basically stop the variable from leaking out outside of its namespace. That's what my understanding of closures are. But when the number of attributes and methods gets larger, it's better to implement a class. Let's just go over a simple example. Well, as simple as I can make it. Okay, so we have a function definition. Wait, actually, hang on. I think it's not completed yet. Yeah, why is it so weirdly tabbed? I don't know. Oh, it's part of it. That's so weird. No, wait. Why is it giving a syntax error? Let me just recopy and paste this and just let's see what happens. Alright, prints out hello. Actually, let me just comment this line out and let's see what happens. Nothing gets printed. Right, let me just go over the explanation, maybe that'll shed some light. We can see that the nested function printer was able to access a non-local variable message inside of the closing function. Oh, so message, the argument message from print message is being accessed by printer but, and the reason it can do that is because it's not closed. Let's say that this message here was meant to be a different argument instead of what the super function had. You didn't want the printer's argument to be the same as the print message's argument. The way we would solve that problem is by using a closure, that's what it means. So here's a closure example based on the same output. So we have our print message, we have our function, our subfunction, and it takes the message. Now it returns printer, prints hello, I guess simply putting return to printer was the closure here. The print message function was called into string hello, and the return function was bound to the name, another, oh, calling, wait, what? Calling another message, auto remember to finish the executing a print. This technique is where some data gets a lash, it's called a clip. It is so fucking weird. Anyway, let's just go through a different example. Oh my god, honestly, this is what I get for copying and pasting. 
in the future I'm gonna have to make my own code and just learn it on my own. I guess this is what I get for trying to just learn as I go along, I guess. Anyway, we have our super function and a sub function. It multiplies x by n and then returns it. So times 3 is make a multiplier of 3. I guess this would be 9, 3 times 3. Times 5 would be 25, I'm guessing. Oh no, no, it has to call the function. It's just making a decoration on them. So this is an example of a decorator being used. Anyway, now we print it. So times 3 with 9, that should be 27. Times 5 with 3, 15. And then multiplying the two functions together with the variable 2 should be 30. Now here's where the closure gets implemented on line 20. Well, why we, would, why we would need a closure is because of line 20, I mean. So we have our input 2, which is our argument, and it goes to the function times 3. Times 3 is going to use the make multiplier function with 3. So 2 times 3 is going to be 6. So the 3 is going to be the n, and then the def multiplier is going to be the 2. However, the closure is important because we don't want the 2 going all the way to times 5. Basically, you want the argument 2 to close at times 3, and then the output of times 3 should be implemented inside times 5. And we can do that because of the return keyword. So instead of it simply just sliding through, it gets it remembers the multiplication of 2 times 3, and then multiplies that by 5 to give us 30. Oh, you know what? I think this now makes sense. In the previous example, the return printer, that was a closure. That's an example of a closure. It's just, it's been a closure this whole time, and I just never realized it. Or rather, that's what it was called, and I've been, I've been doing it this way. Anyways, I hope this sort of made sense of what closures are. It basically stops the arguments from being messed around when you're using nested functions and nested classes. It's a good way of preventing errors from happening, and it, it is a interview question. If you're going into a coding job with Python, they will ask you about closures. That is what I've learned. Anyways, I hope you guys learned some from the, something from this, and, and have a good one. Peace out, guys. <sighs> Alright guys, let's go over properties, the largest and most complex one. You will learn about the Python at property decorator. The Pythonic way to use getters and setters. I've actually used getters and setters when I was making a video game in Unity with C Sharp. They're actually very useful. And if you're wondering what game it was, it was called The Valley in My Mind, which has been removed from Steam because it got literally less than 80 sales. And it was a terrible game because me and my friends were a bunch of lazy, useless trash people. Anyways, Python has a great concept called a property, well, so do most coding languages, but which makes the life of an object-oriented programmer much simple. Blur. That is true. Before defining and going into the details of what an at property decorator is, let us first build an intuition of why it would be needed in the first place, so we're gonna go through an introduction. Just bear with me, this is actually a very important lesson, but also a very tedious thing. Let us assume you decide to make a class that could store a temperature in degrees Celsius. It could also implement a method that would convert the temperature to Fahrenheit. And here is how it goes. Actually, hang on, let me just copy just the class first. So we have our class Celsius, we have a constructor, which takes itself and then the temperature is set to zero in this initialization. And our self.temperature property is set to temperature, which is zero. Then we have another function called to Fahrenheit, which returns the temperature multiplied by 1.8 plus 32. It's the conversion from Celsius to Fahrenheit. When we call the class with an argument being an integer, that arg integer argument will be set to our Celsius temperature. And then if we use the Fahrenheit function, we can convert that Celsius temperature to Fahrenheit. We could make objects out of this class and mani manipulate the attribute temperature as we wished. <clears throat> so here, we're gonna try this in Python shell. Or Python. Hang on, let me just run this first. Okay, let me try this in shell. We create a variable man and assign it the Celsius class. And we get an error. Alright, let me just do this here. Let me run this, and then man dot temper 
equals 37. I'm guessing I'm doing it entirely wrong. Celsius. Well, I guess I'm just embarrassing myself. Let me just do it up here. We convert the object man into Celsius. Man dot temperature equals 37. Then let's get the. Let me just copy and paste it. Let me just let me just do this. It'll be easier. All right. Now we have the comments. So let's create a new object. Man is assigned to the class Celsius. Let's set its temperature for the setter class. Man dot the property temperature is set to 37. Now let's get the temperature, man dot temperature, and then let's convert it to Fahrenheit, man to Fahrenheit. Now none of this is printed. I'm just curious, let me try print. No, it's giving me a red. So let me just do it over here. Let's print these. This will just give us where in memory our class is located. But let me... Actually, I don't need to print the setter. Let me print the getter. Because when you get something, it is some, you're getting an object that's stored in memory. Or a value of an object that's stored in memory. So it makes more sense to, sense to print man.temperature. Alright, namespace. Actually, let me get rid of this print. Instead of putting in the print namespace, let me just uh, free it as a global. And then let's print this. Okay, so we set the man dot temperature to 37. Now let's get that temperature. It is 37. Now let's convert it man to Fahrenheit. It is now 98.6, which is the temperature of the human body in Fahrenheit. Just getting some water here. All right. Whenever we assign or retrieve an object attribute like temperature, as shown above. Python searches it in the object's dictionary. So, let's print that. Print man dot underscore, this is an underscore dictionary. And inside, using the uh, curly braces, we will search for the key temperature I guess this is basically setting it. You're looking in the dictionary, getting the property, and then setting it. Sorry about that. Ah, uh, what the hell. I'm just gonna roll with it. But basically the dict function, the dictionary function that's built into Python, that's how it manages the getters and setters. Now let's further assume that our class got popular among the clients to start using in their programs, and they added all, all kinds of assignments to the object. One fateful day, a trusted client came in and suggested the temperatures cannot go below negative 270 degrees Celsius, which is zero Kelvin. And he further asked us to add that to our code as a constraint, a value constraint. So basically, we, we want to modify the properties of this class so it doesn't go below a certain value. Uh, hang on, let me... Uh... I hate spam calls so much. I really do. They, they literally make my blood boil. Anyway, an obvious solution is to hide the attribute temperature, make it private, define a new getter, etc. that it interfaces to manipulate it. This can be done as follows. So here's a modification of the class Celsius. So lines 1 through 6 are the same as before. So here's our new updates. Define get temperature self. Now this is our getter, and then we have define get set set temperature. 
which is our setter. To get, it will simply return our temperature, self.temperature, and temperature here has an underscore. This underscore attribute is built in. That's important to know, like for any variable you create, for any property you create, Python will store that as an underscore, then the name of the property you create, so just remember that. Then the set temperature, it takes in a value. If the value is less than negative 270 degrees Celsius, it will raise a value error, so we can define what type of error it gives us with the value error keyword, and then it will print out the statement, the temperature cannot go below negative 273 degrees, it's not possible. And then it will return the value. And then, Print it out. So we assign our Celsius class to C. Okay, so this is an example for our value error. It is not possible to go below that. So it gave us an error and it gave us what we needed. But, anyways. Our value C is set to Celsius negative 277, which is below our value, which gives an error. Then we set C to 37, C dot get temperature, sets temperature to 10, and set temperature to negative 300. Let me just get rid of the get rid of the error creating lines of code. Prints out nothing. Just a print get temperature. 37. And let me uh, copy and paste this again after line 24. Now we have 37 and 10, so we are setting another value for the temperature. And it is storing more than one value. But if we uncommented this, it will raise an error saying that it's not possible. But it will also print out. Let me come comment out the print functions. Because I was surprised that it gave us an error without even actually Yeah, I'm surprised that it gave us an error without printing it. Actually though, why am I surprised by that? That, that makes perfect sense. That if there's something wrong, it should give us an error. But still, the value error function, it basically tells it to output an error, and then we can define in that statement what the error message should be. So if we set it to a value that's below negative 273, it will raise an error. So we don't even have to print it, that's just how it's going to work. So yeah, that's something that I just figured out today while recording this, that's pretty cool. Anyways, this update successfully implements a new restriction. Please know that private variables don't exist in Python, which is a shame. It's a huge shame. Sorry, getting some water there. Because private variables are really important for code security. But they're available in C Sharp, C++, um, Java. I use them. A I use private variables a lot when I was making my game, so it's kind of sad that Python doesn't have that. There are simple norms that need to be followed when using getters and setters. The language itself, though, doesn't apply any restrictions. So C dot temperature and get dot temperature. The underscore that I mentioned earlier is one restriction. So yeah, the big problem with the above update is that all the clients who implemented our previous class in their program have to modify their code. From object.temperature to object.getTemperature. Basically add in the underscore. And all assignments like object.temperature equal to value object.set underscore temperature. This refactoring can cause headaches to clients with hundreds of thousands of lines of code, which is a huge problem in the real world. All in all, our new update was not backwards compatible. This is where the property comes to the rescue. The Pythonic way to deal with this, well the way to deal with this in Python, is to use the following. Actually, it's to add this one line of code to the end over here. So here we use the property keyword, the temperature variable, which is defined as our argument in the constructor, is now the assigned to the property, which has its get temperature and set temperature. It has its getter and setter. 
unless just assign C to the variable Celsius with no item. And they did set a couple of extra functions. One is the print function. Print getting value. Then over here, print setting value. I could have copied and pasted this, but I think it's like one or two lines, it doesn't matter. Anyways, we added a print function to get the to inside the getter and setter to observe that they're being executed. The last line of code makes the proper makes a property object temperature. Simply puts the getters and setters as member attributes that are accessible. Any code that retrie retrieves the value of temperature will automatically call the get temperature instead of a dictionary lookup. And yada yada yada. See that temperature getting value. Let's just test this out. Okay, so we call C, that's the value of the first setting value, it's setting it to 0. Second one sets it to 37, third one sets it to 10. So less, print out C dot temperature. It's not callable, thought it would be. What about now there you go setting value three times and getting it it gets the last value so this time we don't have to use the uh, set underscore or the get underscore we can just use temperature because of line 19 over here oh, sorry these notes are very confusing because the source I got from they want to use this with an example but the example is so monotonous it's just getting kind of annoying to explain with it Let's see. Yeah, we have the two Fahrenheit function. Let's just try this. Print C dot two Fahrenheit. Let's see if this outputs it correctly. Yep, so it gets the value 10, then gets the second value 50. Uh, let me comment this one out. Let's see if we can get the human body temperature again. Let me uh, empty this out. Okay, setting three value. Let me just uh, comment this out as well. And it's setting only two values this time. So now it should only set one value to 37. Okay, it should set its value one time to 37. Then it should get it twice. One is the original value, and then the other is the value converted to Fahrenheit. Okay, so it sets it once, gets it once, prints it, gets it twice, and then prints that. So there we go. So by using property, we can see that we modified our class and implemented a value constraint without any change required to our client code. Basically, it's backwards compatible, so all the people who had the first version without anything from lines 8 to 17. Basically, if these lines were not here and somebody else was using the class without the lines that I've highlighted, as long as they have line 19, they can use the old version of the class as well as the new version of the class without any errors. On a final note, the actual temperature is stored in a private variable temperature. What do you mean private? You just said there were no private variables. Oh, whatever. Oh, it's private in terms of accessibility, not in general. The attribute temperature is a property which provides interface to this private variable. In Python, property is built is a built-in function that creates and returns a property object. The signature of this function is property with the argument fget, fset, fdelete, and then documentation none. And that's for the property keyword. Where fget is a function to get the value of the attribute, fset is to set the value of the attribute, fdelete is to delete an attribute, and then the document is a string, like a comment we can add to a property. As seen from the implementation, these function arguments are optional because we only have our get and set, but not our delete or doc. So property can simply be created as follows, without any arguments at all. And this explains what we did in line 19. And basically, line 19 could have been broken down as the following. Lines 21 to 26 do the same thing as line 19. It's the same thing. It's just a shorter way of writing it. And 
let's see. Programmers familiar with decorators in Python can recognize that the above construct is similar to de decorators, or it can be implemented as decorators. Which is true. Here's an example of that. So we are implementing our property and setter as decorators. So here we have our property decorator. It takes temperature, basically does what property did in line 19. And for the getter, it's going to return itself, the value of temperature. And then as a setter, which is basically the property temperature dot setter, so the getter is already pre-built in when initializing the property, but the setter has different functionality because it's separate from getter. And here we're going to implement our restriction. And this does the same thing as our previous code. Except it doesn't show the setting, it only shows the getting. Let me C equals Celsius 100. Let me try seeing if we can get the setter setter function to be called. Nope, it does not call our setters, only says our getters. I mean, that makes sense. It's printing out the... Okay, it's printing out the property. But the property.setter is a different one, so... That's just something to keep in mind. Also notice that these both have the same function name. It's just a different decorators change the property of it. Anyway, the, this implementation is a simple and recommended way of making properties. You have, if you want to make a property, you have to make it as a decoration. Essentially, and you will encounter these when working when looking for properties in Python. Anyway, that's properties in a nutshell for Python. I hope you guys learned something from this and ha have a good one. The next video, I don't know what I'll cover, but it'll be tedious as well. Anyways, peace out.